Good morning, everybody. We are ready to get started on our last chapter of The Devil's Arithmetic. It's a short chapter, and we're also going to do the epilogue so that we can kind of tie up some of the loose ends. Um, remember in chapter 18, chapter 18 was a difficult chapter. Um, Commandant Brewer was there, and he, you know, collectively had everybody in the camp there watching as he punished those that tried to escape. So they were executed. They were put up against the firing wall and they were executed, um, Shmuel being one of them. And Shmuel's demeanor during that time was one of defiance and maybe a little bit of arrogance, but um, also wanting to find his love. And he was looking for Fag and, and smiling at Fag. And, and that is the moment that she kind of runs toward him and she throws herself at his feet and um, they're both executed together. So both Shmuel and Fag did die. Yitzchak was not among them. Yitzchak wasn't in the lineup of everybody that was watching and Yitzchak wasn't one of the prisoners that were executed. So Hannah has hope in that. Then the second part of the chapter is when you know, Hannah all of a sudden has these memories and she's kind of flooded with these memories, sort of superimposed one on top of the other. She is, um, she wants to share them. She wants to get those stories out so that somebody can carry on and somebody can remember for all of the six million Jews that lost their lives in the concentration camp. So she's, she's telling them a story and at that moment, the guard comes up. And he says, you know, you're not working and I need three more to fill the load. You know, it's a, an efficient way of doing it. So he chooses Rivka and Esther and Shifri. And Hannah can't bear that. She, it's almost as if she knows she's going to survive, like she's going to be in the future somehow. So she takes Rivka's place. She takes Rivka's place and she goes to the gas chamber with Shifri and Esther and the three of them walk together and Hannah tries to comfort them as they go. And, and that's where our, our, that part of the story ends. But now we're gonna pick up with chapter 19. When the dark finally resolved itself, Hannah found she was looking across an empty hall at a green door marked 4N. Four, for the four member, members of my family, Hannah thought, and N for New Rochelle. She couldn't see Shifri or Esther anywhere. They had slipped away without a farewell. She almost called out their names, thought better of it, and turned to look behind her. There was a large table set with a white cloth. The table was piled high with food, matzah, roast beef, hard boiled egg, goblets of deep red wine. Seven adults and a little blonde boy were sitting there, their mouths open expectantly. Well, Hannah, said the old man at the head of the table, is he coming? Hannah turned back and looked down the long, dark hall. It was still empty. There's no one there, she whispered, no one. Then come back to the table and shut the door, called out the other old man. There's a draft, you know Aunt Rose gets these chills. Sam, don't hurry the child so, she's doing her part. The woman who spoke had a plain face lit up by a special smile. Come, sweetheart, come sit by Aunt Eva. She patted an empty chair next to her, then reached over and picked up her glass of wine. You look so white, Annele, like death. How can we fix that? She raised her glass, looked at Hannah, the chime, to life. She took a sip. Hannah slipped into the chair, knowing it was the one the family reserved for the prophet Elijah, who slipped through the centuries like a fish through water. She watched all the grown-ups raise their glasses. La chime. And Eva turned toward her, smiling. Her sweater was pushed back beyond her wrist. As she raised the glass again, Hannah noticed the number on her arm, J18202. Annalee, you're staring, whispered Aunt Eva, as the talk began around the table. Uncle Sam arguing about the price of new cars. Grandpa Will complaining about the latest government scandal. Her mother asking Aunt Rose about a book. Staring, she repeated the word without understanding. Yes, at my arm, at the number. Does it frighten you still? 
You never let me explain it to you and your mother hates me to talk of it. Still, if you want me to. Hannah touched the number on her aunt's arm with surprising gentleness, whispering, no, no, please let me explain it to you. For a moment she was silent and then she said, J is for Jew and one because you were alone. Alone of the eight who had been in your family, though two was the actual number of them alive. Your brother was a commando, one of the Jews forced to tend the ovens to handle the dead. So he thought he was a zero. She looked up at Aunt Eva who was staring at her. Oh, your brother, Grandpa Will, that must have been him carrying Fig. So that's why. Aunt Eva closed her eyes for a moment as if thinking or remembering. Then she whispered back. His name was Woofy, Woofy. And the irony of it was that he was as gentle as a lamb. He changed his name when we came to America. We all changed our names. To forget. Remembering was too painful, but to forget was impossible. Her coffee brown eyes opened again. Go on, child. Han Hannah took her hand from her aunt's arm and dropped it into the safety of her own lap. She couldn't look at her aunt anymore. That familiar, unfamiliar, plain, beautiful face. You said, she whispered, you said that when things were over, you would be two again forever. J18202. They sat for a long moment in silence while the talk and laughter at the table dipped and soared about them like swallows. At last, Hannah looked up. Her aunt was staring at her as if really seeing her for the first time. Aunt Eva, Hannah began as Eva's hand touched her on the lips firmly as if to stop her mouth from saying what had to be said. In my village, in the camp, in the past, Eva said, I was called Rivka. Hannah nodded and took her aunt's fingers from her lips. She said in a voice much louder than she had intended, so loud that the entire table hushed at its sound. I remember, oh, I remember. The epilogue. Aunt Eva told Hannah the rest of the story much later when the two of them were alone because no one else would have ever believed them. She said that of all the villagers, young Chaya had come to the camp with that spring. Only two were alive at the end of the war. Yitzchak, who had indeed escaped, had lived in the forest with the partisans, fighting the Germans and, get, and Gittel. When the camp had been liberated in 1945, Gittel weighed only 73 pounds because she had insisted on sharing her rations with the children. But she was alive. The Blokova and all of the villagers from Vyosk were dead. But among the living besides Gittel, Yitschak, and Rivka were Lei and her baby, a solemn three-year-old. Gittel and Yitschak had emigrated to Israel, where they lived, close friends, until well into their 70s. Neither of them ever married. Yitschak became a politician, a member of the Israeli Senate, the Neset. Gittel was known throughout the country as Tante Gittel and Gittel the Bear, organized a rescue mission dedicated to savaging, salvaging the lives of young survivors and locating the remnants of their families. It later became an adoption agency, the finest in the Mideast. She called it after her young niece, who had died a hero in the camps, Chaya, which means light. And that is the end of our story and the completion of our novel. We will um, talk about it a little bit later in the week, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you.